Og det gælder bare, at det gælder dels jer, der sidder her i Per Kirby Auditoriet, men det gælder også dem, der sidder ude og ser den her debataften på nettet. Velkommen. Velkommen til den nye værdidebat, som vi kalder den. Velkommen til en forsamlingshusdebat, eller højskoledebat, om værdiers betydning og værdiers betydning for samfundet, for demokratiet og for politik. Jeg hedder Michael Bøs. Jeg er vært i den første del af aftenen. Som I ved, består aftenen af to dele. I den første del, der vil jeg interviewe de to personer, der sidder til venstre for mig på engelsk. Og det er fordi, den ene ikke forstår dansk. I havde nok forventet at se tre personer. Den tredje person har strandet i Kastrup. Det er Ron Engelhardt. Og vi vil forsøge at gøre godt, så vidt vi nu kan. Specielt Peter Gundalak er en god kender af Engelhards teorier, og jeg kan supplere, og Ron Engelhards meget gode ven og kollega, Robert Kroppen, kan også sige noget. Og det vil vi have sådan en samtale om værdier og værdipolitik, og hvornår vi det hele taget begyndt at tale om, om værdipolitik. For det er jo ikke noget, vi har gjort i så mange år. Hvorfor gjorde vi det, og hvornår begyndte det? Og det vil vi gøre frem til kl. 8, og så vil det være en meget, meget kort pause, som kun kan bruges til det højst nødvendige. Der kan være forskellige behov selvfølgelig, men altså tænk på det. Vi skal nemlig starte meget kort efter kl. 10 minutter over 8. Og så skal vi have den her debat om værdier i Danmark, og hvordan vi diskuterer værdier, og hvilken betydning de har, det her, de værdier har for politikken og for samfundet. Og det er en debat, som vil blive, hvor, når vi skifter ordstyre, den vil blive ledet og styret af chefredaktør Erik Bjerger fra Kristi Dagblad. Kristi Dagblad er den ene af samarbejdspartnerne omkring den her aften. Den anden er Folkeuniversitetet i Aarhus. Jeg vil gerne benytte lejligheden til at takke begge for jeres medvirken i den her aften. Det er fantastisk, at I kan medvirke til endnu et folkeligt arrangement inden for Matchpoint-seminar. Fordi det er jo meget vigtigt, og det er noget, vi lægger stor vægt på, at vi har nogle akademiske dele, og så har vi nogle dele for den brede offentlighed, nogle, ofte nogle debatarrangementer. Det ligger helt i tråd med det, som vi ønsker på Aarhus Universitet, nemlig at bruge Matchpoint-seminaret som en åben dør til det opgivende samfund. Og det vi ønsker, det er at tage emner op, som har bred offentlig betydning. Og vi håber også, den ambition har vi også, at vi måske kan komme med vores indspil i den hjemlige debat. Så velkommen til jer alle sammen. Og så vil jeg stå over på engelsk. Og vi skal nok forsøge at tale et engelsk, som er rimeligt forståeligt. Så so, well, warm welcome to my guests here. On my left hand first, Professor Robert D. Putnam from Harvard University, our distinguished visiting professor at Aarhus University this year and in 2014, and to Professor Peter Gundelag from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, these two gentlemen, they know a lot about values and about the significance of values, values such as trust, for, democrat, for democracy, for society, for politics. And I think it might be a good idea if we briefly start out considering values. What do we understand with this concept? What does values mean? Um, how do we understand social values, Peter Gondelag? Well, it is a difficult question because there are virtually hundreds of definitions of values, but I prefer sort of a very sim simple definition which says that values are invisible, something inside us. We cannot observe it directly. Uh, it's a very stable uh, construction, which means that values are not dependent upon different situations, but they are much broader uh, uh, concerning many different situations 
and uh, it's about, of course, what is good or bad. So it's uh, invisible things, we construct them based on various kinds of measurement. Dr. Putnam, uh, do values play any role in your research? Oh, they do. Um, I think um, it's perhaps easiest to think about uh, a politics based on values, say, by contrasting it with something else. Because one's first reaction is to think, well, all politics must be based on values. But I think that's not the way the term is meant by Ron Engelhardt, who's our, our missing um, partner here. Um, and often when people talk about a politics of values, they're distinguishing that from a politics of interests. So that we speak of the question of what should be the size of the subsidy for beet growing as not an issue of values but an issue of interests. But we would think about the subject of, um, to take an American case, um, almost, uh, the uh, issue of, of gay marriage or of homosexual rights as being a values interest because it goes to deep personal values that people have. Um, on the one hand, I think one might welcome a politics of values. You might say, why would you want to have politics just be about mundane interests? Don't we all aspire to a politics which engages our deepest sense of moral right and wrong, as you say? Um, on the other hand, you might be fearful of a politics based on values because you might think that it's harder to reach a compromise on values, a modus, it's harder to reach a modus vivendi on values um, so that we can easily reach some kind of compromise if you think that the subsidy for beets should be two euros and you think it should be one euro, well, come on, let's just make it uh, one and a half euros. But if you think the issue of values is about, let's take the case, I'm again I'm using an example from the United States, the, the case of abortion, you might think, well, that's a fundamental issue about how you feel about life um, if you're on the side of restrictions on abortion, or how you feel about the fundamental freedom of women to control their own bodies, and that's another fundamental value, and you think, how could you possibly, what's the analog in that case to a beat subsidy of one and a half euros? So I can think, I think there are some attractions to a politics based on values and a, some, some concerns about a, a politics based on values. In the Danish context, political scientists would distinguish between politics of distribution and politics of values, and we have a special word for politik and fordelingspolitik. Uh, we'll come back to that, but uh, one of my values is informality. So I'll switch and say, Peter, uh, Peter, uh, <laughs> can values be measured? You have been measuring values over decades. You're responsible for the Danish part of the European Values Studies project. Perhaps you can say a few things about how you measure values and why this whole idea of measuring our European values, how it came up. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the way it's done in the European Value Survey and in the World Value Survey that uh, Ron Inglehart is uh, chairing is through the use of questionnaires, identical questionnaires on different kinds of values in different countries. So we use exactly the same question in many different countries, which means that it's possible to compare all the countries on the same variable, so to speak. And also these uh, uh, questions are, some, some of them are measured several times, so what, several times, uh, in my own case, they have been measured in 1981, 1990, 1999, 2008. So this means that you are able to compare between countries and across time, which is very important for describing what is going on. Um, 
Another characteristic of the, this project is that they measure many different kinds of values, religious, political, work values, family values, and so on, which means that it's, very, uh, it's better than just measuring in a very specific project, a specific type of value. So you can, for instance, correlate, uh, compare values in different countries in relation to the impact of religion on family values, things like that. So that's uh, sort of the basic asset of, of this project. Um, in Europe, it, this project began in uh, 1981. That was the first data collection in 1981. And 10 countries participated at that time. It originated from a group of scholars at universities in Germany, the Netherlands, um, in particular those countries, and in particular people from Catholic universities. And they, um, they created this project in order to get data to understand what was going on in Europe at the time, because after the 60s, uh, there was a general concern about uh, what would happen to the values in Europe? Would there be? Um, I mean, people were watching divorces, um, um, women's uh, entry into the labor market would have impacts on the families. Religion seemed to be threatened. All kinds of things that seemed to point into a direction of a deterioration of the integration in society. Mm -hmm. So these people, they wanted to figure out what was going on, and instead of just being <coughs> concerned about them, once they started it. Uh, and actually, just to tell you an anecdote about this, uh, Denmark was not part of that group in the beginning, because no Danish scholars at the time were interested in values. They were interested in interest, to use your phrase. Uh, and so the first uh, uh, wave of data collection was carried out without any scholars, any social science scholars in Denmark. And it was financed by some foundation from abroad. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you are in the fortunate situation that these value studies have been carried on every 10 years. Uh, so, we're now 30 years removed from the beginnings. So, could you confirm, uh, were the, the originators of this idea, were they justified in, in, in being worried about uh, the change of values and the no, deterioration of values. On the contrary, they were completely wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, and some of this may be due to, if you talk methodological about it, may be due to the fact that most of the changes that they were concerned about had happened earlier than 1981, in the 60s, in the 70s. And after the 1980s, things have been much more stable and uh, there are no signs of social disintegration or anything like that. So values are pretty, social values are pretty robust. They are, they're pretty robust and stable, and if I should just uh, explain why, since Ron Engelhardt is not here, he, he would yes. have, he would have, he has a certain machine for explaining that, which is a, a generational explanation, right? what he calls the cohort replacement, which means that uh, the values that you acquire in your formative years, before you are something like 25 years old, they tend to be stable for the rest of your life. So people like us who are pretty old, we, will, we have not gained any kind of change in our values since we were young. That would be his, uh, his argument. But many, many differences, of course, and nuances, but that would be the general idea. So he said, yes, uh, that, um, to speak metaphorically, you, you sort of, you get your values and you enter, you could walk into an escalator and then you stand still while the escalator is uh, 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 changing or, or moving so you feel that things are moving but actually you're just in the same position as ever. Okay, I'm teaching at a, at a university, I'm teaching within the humanities faculty of what used to be called that, it's called arts nowadays. Uh, I'm used to listening and, and, and teaching postmodern theory and postmodern theory said that we are living in an age in the where values are fluctuating so yeah. you don't uh, you, this this thesis is not correct well of course uh, there's there are some values that are changing hmm. uh, more rapidly than others and and maybe we can come back to that but uh, the general uh, result of our analysis is that there are no reasons to believe this uh, postmodernist description. And we have done that in, in two uh, 
to have ten, ten, uh, check that in two ways. First of all, we have checked whether the values that people have in different groups, for instance, uh, men, women, young, old, uh, different occupation groups, whether the correlation between those characteristics and the values have changed over time, and they have not. Uh, the second check is to, to analyze whether the correlations between different values have, are stable or have disappeared, which in this latter case that would be postmodernism. Mm. Everything is dissolving, and there are no, no signs of that either. So we are standing firmly on a modernistic uh, analysis, analysis. So, uh, Bob, if you excuse me for being so ethnocentric, uh, maybe we just finish with the Danish case. So, what are the stable Danish values? There are several of them. Uh, religion is fairly stable, family values are fairly stable, um, uh, many political values are fairly stable, um, but there is also this increase in as predicted by Ron Engelhardt in values that are becoming more um, self-realization values, less authoritarian values. We also find a huge increase in the levels of trust, uh, levels of tolerance towards immigrants, um, increase in um, freedom of speech values related to freedom of speech. So all in all, we, have, we find that um, the integrational part of the Danish values are, are fairly strong. Mm -hmm. So there's no risk, no risk of, of a, you, it doesn't make any sense to talk about, about the values crisis in society. I think so. Yes, Bob. I just wanted to ask a question. Um, you talked about the increase in uh, tolerance for, and, uh, for, uh, for immigrants and um, increases in, I think you said, emphasis on free expression, if I understand correctly. Are those changes, are those, as Ron would say, cohort changes? That is, are those driven by the fact that younger Danes are consistently more open to immigrants or more convinced of, free, of the rights of free expression, and therefore the, it's the generational arithmetic that's increasing that change, or are those changes apply across the board to all age groups? Well, it's both actually, but, but the most important thing is that what you call across the border, uh, what he would call um, period effects. So during this period, there's a general increase in tolerance, in trust, and so on. Mm. But there's one factor. You mentioned you may share values within your generation, but what but generations change? So generations change, so we might not be sure that the, the new generations would share your values. No, of course not. And that, that's a part of this idea of the cohort uh, replacement. Uh, and I could just give you one of the best examples in the Danish case of cohort replacement is a question in the questionnaire where people are asked whether they would avoid to pay a ticket in public transportation. And this is extremely well described as a cohort replacement. So the younger cohorts are much more reluctant to pay for tickets in public transportation. And if you draw a graph of that, the lines would be completely horizontal. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron Engelhardt would argue that as society becomes uh, uh, more prosperous, as it becomes more secular, as we tend to cherish what he calls post-material values, also, he calls them self-expression values. We're bound to be, become individualists. And that is, one might suppose that might be a problem for the sense of community. Now, Bob, would you say that, is that your own experience? Is that the results you have from your research that uh, the changes that you're observing are, are not affecting us? community, community cohesion in America? Well, I have to make uh, several points here. First of all, um, there are many ways to assess the state of a, of a culture or of a society, and examining values is one important way of doing that. Um, another way of doing it is to examine behavior, 
whatever people say, do they, do they walk the walk? In, 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 in American political jargon, we distinguish between walking the walk and talking the talk. You could talk the talk means you're able to, you, you, say what, you say what values you have, but the walking is actually doing, in, implementing those values in practice. And so, in my own work, frankly, I've spent more time on the measures of behavior than of values, but in the, in the U.S. case, um, there are significant cohort differences in America, uh, both in terms of value and in terms of behavior. I wouldn't put them all under a single rubric, but let me give some examples. There's an extremely st strong cohort difference that it's according to different, when people were born, different birth cohorts on issues surrounding homosexuality. So younger people in America are much, much more open-minded and less censorious, less critical about um, homosexual behavior, including gay marriage, for example, uh, than older people are. There's been some change among all generations, but overwhelmingly the change is driven by generational arithmetic. By that I mean, given the sharp differences I, I don't know, I don't have the exact numbers in, in my memory, but something like 80% um, of people who are now in their 20s and 30s uh, favor gay marriage, and of people my age, at the higher end of the age hierarchy, something like 20 or 30% of my age contemporaries um, uh, support gay marriage or homosexuality. One of the things about cohort, one of the reasons that Ron is interested, and I also am interested in cohort change, is that cohort change is by its nature slow because it depends upon my generation passing from the scene and my grandchildren, who have a much different view, coming into the scene, and that happens, fortunately, slowly. Um, but, um, but surely, it's, it's slow, but it's change that's very hard to reverse. Whereas period effects, as you've described, can move in one way or another way right. pretty easily. So the advantage of thinking about cohort different cohort driven change is it's very likely to be um, fundamental and, and continuing. Oh. There are big cohort differences on um, homosexuality and big cohort differences in America on um, attitudes to free speech, as you say, and big cohort differences. Younger people are are. Uh, much, much more tolerant along racial lines, uh, much more tolerant of, for example, racial intermarriage, and all of those are cohort changes, and that means they're slow, but very likely to persist. And given my values, I think all of those are changes in the right direction. On the other hand, both with respect to values and with respect to behavior, it is true that there are cohort differences that are moving our society towards a more individualistic society. People more focused on me and less focused on we, and that those sorts of changes, which means people are much less likely to take part in collective activity and more likely to take part in, in individualistic activity. That means that, again, because those are cohort changes, they're slow, but they're moving all in the same direction. And I'll change my metaphor here, that if you think of a pendulum that swings between an emphasis on individual rights and an emphasis on collective responsibilities, the American pendulum in my lifetime has swung from being in the, when I was growing up in the, in the 1950s, a good deal of emphasis on collective responsibilities, it swung mm. very far over towards a de-emphasis on collective responsibilities, a de-emphasis on social solidarity, for example, and an increased emphasis among the younger generation on individualism. And so I, have, uh, I think there are both change positive, what I would think of myself as positive and negative changes. But Peter, this is not the observation in Denmark, and your, your team didn't observe a less, uh, less emphasis on community values and community fail escape. No, not really. I mean, one of the, the important um, things that uh, you've shown with your, uh, on social capital and the, the decrease of social capital is not found in Denmark. We found just the opposite. 
that uh, there's an increase in trust in, in membership of voluntary associations and so on. But there is, um, th th we may be overemphasizing that if you go to uh, different data sources, because when we have published, or people have published on this, they have published on survey data. But we also have registered data, for instance, a membership of the Danish state church or trade unions, which are extremely important integrative uh, associations. And when we look at that, it seems that they are bleeding, very slowly they are bleeding. So fewer members of the state church, uh, fewer members of the uh, trade unions. And we can see that has some kind of relationship to Inglehart's explanation since people who are not becoming member of a state church or trade unions have parents who are not members. So they are socialized into that. As, and this may not be a completely a cohort effect, but still it shows you the importance of socialization. Let's turn to the question of values and their implication and the significance for politics. Now, when uh, Ron Inglehart started making his uh, research into values and their impact on politics, he noted that there was a difference between the values and norms that motivated voters in the 1960s and in the 1980s. In the 1960s, people were still concerned with their uh, economic security, with their f well, physical security. They were, uh, they were voting on issues of social welfare, uh, the economy, etc. But then he noted that in the 1980s, the voters would have different motivations. They would be uh, voted, that what would interest them was actually issues like the environment, like identity, like gender inequality, things like that. And these are the values that he, he calls are uh, self-expression values or post-material values. If we and, and this, of course, must have uh, had um, an effect on, on politics, because politics till then had been, or political parties had been, a product of industrial society. And so all the various parties reflected various class interests. But now, this, when the situation changed, um, political parties had a harder time determining and finding out what their voters <coughs> were interested in. And so we have this change to the mean to from ideologies, from political ideologies to values. And in the 1990s, all over the world, especially in Europe, we talk about values politics. And you may remember how Tony Blair said, in order to make the transformation of the Labour Party in Britain, he said, "Well, politics today is not about ideologies; it's about values." And he often spoke and wrote about this. Did we see the same thing happening in Denmark in the 1990s, Peter? We did, but uh, it takes a, has a certain, certain specific flavor in Denmark. Since this, in Denmark, uh, politics, values politics was very much associated with the question about immigration. And uh, I think this is maybe a very specific Danish uh, story, which means uh, which had huge impact on the political system. Uh, the political parties were divided on in relation to the question of immigrants, and this bec it, it became sort of the saying um, values politics was the same as saying something about immigration. Of course, there were other issues that were close to that. You mentioned the environment, other things, but if you say if you should talk about value politics in one word, you would talk about immigration, mm. and this changed. Uh, I mean, this was, it became a, a strong political uh, debate and fierce struggle between different political parties. And even within political parties, the social democrats were divided for a long period in relation to, to this. So this was one of the very strong social debates at the time. But certainly today, we also talk about values, uh, values in involved in the system of justice or Absolutely. in education. We are going through a dis debate now and we're preparing for educational reform. So isn't that, uh, aren't there values involved in, in many other oh, yeah, policy areas? I, mm. I, my, uh, my argument was at, at this cursory level that at that time 
immigration became values in, in a sense of relation, uh, the, the perception of immigration. And now it has, has changed somewhat to be a much broader concept, as you have indicated, relations to uh, the environment, to justice, to freedom of speech, many other things. But at that time, when the, the concept sort of became public, in the beginning it became public, it was very much related to immigration since uh, the Danish political parties had strong problems in, in coping with the problems that were caused by immigration. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we will return to this discussion in the second part of tonight's program. However, I want to turn to you now, Bob, because uh, you became famous, world famous, for a book that you wrote uh, around 2000 called Bowling Alone. And uh, you, you are a very committed person. I know you know enough now. You're very engaged in, what you, uh, in the things that you do your research in. What was it that motivated you to go into the studies that you are to the data collection that formed the basis of the, your later book on bowling alone? Perhaps you can, can explain us uh, something about this. Yes. Well, you know, when one talks about one's own work one can, and tries to explain it, one can um, use one of two frames of reference. One can talk about what is the intellectual frame of reference that led you to address a particular problem, and I'll say a word about that. Um, uh, I had done this earlier work on a completely different topic, namely uh, government in different parts of Italy, and that research, which was trying to explain why some places in Italy were better governed than other places in Italy, um, the, the shorthand answer to that was uh, choral societies that, or, 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 or reading groups that some, some regions where there was a dense civic, soci dense civic society or what I came to say, what I came to call social capital, that is networks that brought citizens together were better governed than places where there wasn't this active civic engagement. So you meant that you could actually go out and count how many how many choirs are there in this region of Italy and, 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 and in the northern part and the southern part and where there were most choirs that would also best be best governance? That's right. Mm -hmm. Indeed, eventually we showed that uh, if you tell me how many choral societies a region of government had in the year 1200, I can tell you plus or minus three days how long it will take you to get your health bills reimbursed by the regional bureaucracy. So there's a very strong relationship between these deep traditions, either of active civic engagement or not active civic engagement. I came to call that social capital, and, and it, there was, in the Italian case, a very, sh a very clear relationship between social capital and democracy. And then that led me um, back, that kind of thinking led me, as I went back to America, to wonder whether there was any connection between what I had been um, studying as a, as, a, uh, as a scholar and what I was concerned about as a citizen. As a citizen, I was concerned about how well or poorly American democracy um, uh, had been functioning when I was growing up um, in, the, in the 1950s and in early 1960s. If you ask Americans do you trust the government to do what's right most of the time? 75% of Americans said they did trust the government to do what's right most of the time. Uh, now that figure is about 15%, from 75% to 15%. That's been steadily declining. Um, and uh, I, of course it's interesting to try to figure out what might have caused that. One possible hypothesis is that if you look carefully at the data, the data begin to decline, the trust in government in America begin, and the quality of government begins to decline exactly the year in which I personally started to vote, which is 1964. So it occurred to me that I personally might have caused this <laughs> collapse of American democracy. But of course, like a good social scientist, I was interested in other, other hypotheses. And, um, and so it, did, it occurred to me to wonder whether there had been, what had been the changes in social capital in this sense of civic engagement 
participation in community, community life uh, over the previous uh, 50 years. And what I discovered, uh, frankly, I was originally a little surprised at the discovery, was that there had been a, a pretty steady decline, not in values measured in surveys, but in the actual participation in organized groups of various sorts, and not just organized groups, but the, the frequency of, of, um, of uh, having dinner with your family was going down. There's been about a 40 or 50 percent decrease in family dinners. Um, uh, there has been, over the last 30 or 40 years in America, about a 60 percent decline in picnics. There's a little notice national picnic crisis. Uh, in America, and I, I found, of course, I didn't really think that American civilization depended upon picnics, but what I'm trying to indicate is what we found was a, a sharp decline, not just in formal voting, although that was down too, but in all these ways in which we got together with one another. So the, the, sh the first answer to your question, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to filibuster here, but the first answer to your question is I was led by my scholarly interests to try to understand a a public problem that was of concern not just to me but to other Americans. And I produced this book and then we, we had various groups that tried to figure out what we do about it. Bob, you have used the term social capital several times. Maybe you should explain how you define that concept. Sure. Um, I simply mean, I, by it I mean social networks, the networks of, that we're all involved in the, the, and the associated norms of reciprocity. Uh, the core idea of social capital is simply that social networks have value. They have value to the people who are in the networks. You live longer. Um, the, the, the more you are involved in, the more group involvement you have. Um, the data here are very clear. As I said earlier in this room, and some people will have been here and others will not, um, holding constant all of the other things that affect your life expectancy holding constant your age and your gender and whether you jog and, and whether you smoke and so on, your chances of dying over the next year are cut in half by joining one group, um, cut in three quarters by joining two groups. Um, one of the reasons, the statistics suggest, that um, Danes and in general Scandinavians are healthier than most other people in the world is that you're you tend to be joiners and connectors. Uh, there's a high level of social capital in this, in this part of the world. Um, and so part of what we were noticing is that, that Americans were, um, well, we're smoking less, which is good news, but we're joining less, which is bad news, and that sort of balances out. But if you, you sort of like to get us to stop smoking but start joining again. I have to say the other... So social capital just simply means these social networks that have value for the, the, the higher the social capital in the community, the lower the crime rate because people are looking out for one another, the higher the social capital in the community, the longer people live, the better the schools work, the less the tax evasion, the more efficient the government. Um, uh, indeed, it began to seem after a while that social capital did everything you'd want. I mean, just have a lot of, take two capsules of social capital and, uh, and you'll be, be happier. It turns out happiness, too, is strongly affected by, by, um, by social capital. However, and I'm, I'm just about to conclude, there is a, this is now in a, in a little more um, personal reflect, mode of self-reflection. I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't want to have this, what I'm about to say, be too widely discussed because it will open up. Uh, attacks on my work of a particular sort, but I know that I, I know that Danes are very trustworthy, so I'm just speaking privately among our, us group of friends here. I happen to grow up in a small town in um, the middle of America, small farming and, and small industry, light industry town in the uh, 5,000 people, so Aarhus seems like a really big city to me. Um, and um, this was in the 1950s, and um, the town, it turns out, had a lot of social capital in it. People were joining and cooperating and, and people would help one another and they would help other kids, other people's kids and, and, um, and large numbers of my classmates who came from relatively poor backgrounds nevertheless went to college because 
if the, if the, although their parents would not maybe be able to help them go to college, somebody else would step in and so on. Um, and, um, and this is not now just the standard older the, uh, affliction of older people, which is you remember your past as being nicer than it was. We've now gone back and looked, and that, that, my, that recollection of this town as having a lot of social capital was true. It really did have a lot of social capital. Measurements show it. I will show you the statistics that show that this town had a lot of social capital. But I think there's probably at a subconscious level, I might have been saying, although it was not a conscious um, motivation, I had a pretty good childhood. People mm. were looking, looking out for one another and taking care of one another and, and it, was, it was a pretty equal kind of place. There wasn't anybody very rich in my town and there wasn't anybody very poor. It was in a way a slight approximation of, I never thought of this before, Denmark. Um, <laughs> not many rich people, not many poor people, people looking out for one another, high levels of social trust. And so in a way that book, Bowling Alone, might be read as simply the ruminations of an aging um, mm. progressive who thought I had a pretty good childhood and I wish kids now had that kind of a childhood. Would you call that your hometown a socially cohesive community? Yes. And why? Um, it was a socially cohesive community for good and ill, I have to say. This is important to add this. It was a socially co uh, cohesive community because people thought of themselves as responsible for one another. When people in my, so I'm going to say the positive first and then I'll say the negative. When people in my hometown talked about our kids, our children, and we've got to do things for our kids so that they can have a better life and so on, they did not, when, when my parents said our kids, they did not mean my sister and me alone. They meant all the kids in town. The word our was a collective. It meant we, it was a collective we. It was the we in Port Clinton. If you listen carefully to people nowadays in America, when they, use, when they talk about our kids, worrying about our kids getting to college, they mean my biological kids. Um, that across America over this period, and this is the embodiment of the decline in social cohesion that you've talked about, there's been a narrowing of the concept of we. We means people like me, or actually it just means me. <laughs> um, and, and that's a sense in which I, I really bemoan, I regret, more than I can say, the collapse of that sense of shared responsibility for one another. I think it leads to, is leading in America now, true to a growing gap between rich kids and poor kids, to a, the movement of the society, frankly, a little bit in a direction of, 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 of two Americas, a relatively well-off America, my grandchildren are going to be in that part, and a relatively less well-off America, and other kids who are just as nice as my kids are going to be in that America. So that's a good part of social cohesion. It, 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 it kept, if you were, you know, part of that community, it, it, um, it was positive. But I also have to say that this was largely a white community and um, it was not always a, a community that was very tolerant of difference. It was certainly not tolerant of differences in sexual affinities so no one was out of nobody was out of the closet and I'll, and I imagine that there were people in fact I know that there were people in my class who were uh, gay or homosexual in their private preferences and felt enormously oppressed by this social cohesion I mean really deep pain they felt people these were close friends of mine that I I didn't know they were gay but I now do and black people were although they were not, this was a northern city, so there was not legal segregation, but black people faced serious problems in this town. And women, there was a very sharp ceiling beyond which women didn't go. And so I think in some respects, America is now much better off that the country as a whole is not so hemmed in by those older prejudices. I don't 
for a moment want to say it's my view about America is not that everything has gone bad. It's just that some things have gone great. We're a much less racist society than we used to be. We're a much less uh, gender segregated society than we used to be. We're certainly much less homophobic than we used to be, but we're also, we care about one another less, and I'd like to have the, I'd like to keep the good changes and not have the bad changes, and whether that's a, that's the kind of vain hope of an aging idealist, or whether it's a practical political program, um, if I thought it was a practical political program, I probably would run for president. So I don't, I don't quite know that it's practical, but I do think it's a good aspiration. Peter, uh, when the concept of social cohesion or social Sammenhangskraft is used in Denmark, does that reflect the same experience as we, as Bob described, or, or how is it used in the Danish context? Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's used in quite a different way. It's used uh -huh. as a political metaphor and is mostly valued by right-wing politicians, I would say. And, and one example of that is when the, the Minister of Social Affairs, Karin Jespersen, who was uh, Minister for Venstre, as you all know, in a, a right-wing party, uh, she was... Um, she became Minister of Social Affairs. She said she wanted to be a Minister of Sammenhingskraft Social Cohesion. And by that, she meant two things. She meant uh, that there should be a little inequality in Denmark. So the, at the vertical level, there should be, Denmark should be as it is, a very egalitarian society. But she also meant that everybody, I'm sort of, paraphrasing her, making it a bit stronger than she said it, everybody should adhere to basic fundamental Danish values. So she wanted a value, uh, homogeneous society. So on the one hand, she wanted the traditional social democratic way of organizing society. On the other hand, she wanted social cohesion to mean um, a strong integration of all kinds of values into the same pattern. But I'm sure that there would be many Danish social democrats and socialists who would argue that they also have a concept of social cohesion. Uh, that is a society which where, where there's too much uh, inequality would be uh, in danger of, of collapse, yeah. collapsing or fra fragmenting. Um, yeah. isn't, there, isn't there this tradition also? Yeah, but that, exactly, but she had the two dimensions. Mm. You have both the inequality, the economic inequality, and the values uh, dimension. But, uh, that, uh, yeah. And I think that is what is um, characteristic of that kind of debate. Uh, that was also a French Minister of Social Affairs who called mm. himself Minister of Social Cohesion. And it's a very specific way of using the word in a Danish okay. context, I think. Yeah. So if, if you use it in, in your term, it's quite a different story. But, you know, actually I do think there's, some, there's a deeper similarity here, which is, in a sense, what I'm longing for is a sense of social cohesion and the sense of feeling responsible for one another and feeling obligations outside the, the self um, without at the same time bringing along the, the value exclusiveness that was characteristic of that of Port Clinton uh, in, in those years. And I think that is actually, it certainly is a, it, that's a, a challenge that America faces now. It may be a challenge that Denmark faces. Can you keep the kind of good, from my point of view, good sort of solidarity that, that treats all of us as members of the same community and that we have responsibilities to one another and that we really are only going to succeed if we all succeed? That's the first meaning. But can you get that without having the feeling that we all have to pledge allegiance to exactly the same values and we all have to have exactly the same sexual preferences and we all have to have exactly the same hair color and, and so on. And I, I think I'd like to have the one without the other, but maybe you can't get the one without the other. That's the dilemma. But Peter and, and Bob, does culture not play any role in the sure. formation of values and in, 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 in for social cohesion? Oh, sure. Peter? Sure, absolutely. We, we know that from lots of research, also from Engelhardt's research, there's, there's a strong path dependency from, col from uh, over time where different cultures uh, tend to create more st fairly stable values and 
that, um, for instance, religious uh, uh, values, uh, religious patterns are very strong, uh, differences between Catholic countries, uh, Protestant countries, so on, and, and, and these, are, these patterns are very stable and have a lot of impact on how mm. people react. As you, even you talked about it this morning when you referred to Max Weber's theory about Protestantism. Mm. But if culture does play a role, Bob, isn't multiculture a problem? Well, no, I, I don't actually see that that follows. I certainly do think that culture or tradition and history play important roles here. It makes it easier for some countries that have a lucky history to be, um, to move in one direction and and um, and countries that or regions or societies that have a different history, it's harder for them, move, them to move in another direction. I'm reminded in that context of a of an experience I had um, in one of the southern Italian regions that we were studying. And I this I we spent 25 years doing this study of Italian regional government, and I got to know the people very well. And one of my closest Pete friends and someone I admired very much was the president of a southern region who was a reformer. He was trying really hard. I, he was not corrupt himself, although the, the setting was a corrupt setting, but he was not corrupt and, and he was wise and he was also sympathetic to my work. But he said to me at one point, Bob, um, I, I trust you. You're a close observer. I, I know you're a good researcher, um, but you're telling me that my fate as, the, as a political reformer here in this region was sealed 800 years ago um, and that there's no way to get from where I am now, from, from where I've been left by history, to where I and you want us to go. And that's a kind of cultural determinism that you might easily read from, from my research, but that I, and he said, he said, I can't allow myself, I can't be a real political actor here if I believe that all I'm doing is simply running down a set of railroad tracks that was fixed, you know, mm -hmm. 800 years ago. So I do think that, for, that it's the job of political leaders and for that matter of engaged intellectuals, not merely to recognize the importance of these historical trajectories, but also to figure out how to get from here to where I want to go. Final question then. It might be a long answer, I know, but I'll stop you, okay? Yeah. Uh, so you wouldn't uh, uh, follow um, uh, Kant Jesperson's line and say that actually diversity, cultural diversity, would endanger social cohesion? We've talked about uh, this this afternoon, indeed much of today. Um, I think that there are advantages to, to cultural homogeneity, to, to social homo and cultural and demographic homogeneity. Um, undoubtedly, it's possible to get things done more quickly if everybody you know, knows exactly the cultural, um, uh, the culturally appropriate actions in a particular context, and so on. And there's no doubt; it's it's hardly a, it's hardly a secret that the the places in the world that have um, have high levels of social capital and that have high levels of of democracy and and so on tend to be places that are um, that are demographically or ethnically homogeneous. On the other hand, there are real virtues from cultural diversity and you'd expect someone, I suppose you'd expect someone who's inevitably uh, aware of my own national experience, we are not a homogeneous country or rather we're homogeneous with respect to a particular set of things but certainly ethnically we're an extremely diverse country, we've done all right and indeed I would say our ethnic diversity is one of America's greatest advantages at this point. I think, in feed, if you're, if, you're, if you're looking at countries in the world into the 21st century and you say, what are the assets and the liabilities that various countries have? My country has lots of liabilities. Uh, we have some assets. We have a good university system. That's an asset. We have um, uh, a reasonably good science enterprise, that's an asset. Uh, 
Um, uh, but by far, I, I mean this seriously, by far I think the most important asset that America has over the next uh, century is we're less bad than most places are at immigration. Um, we're not perfect at it, but we've done it a lot, and, and therefore we can, we can evolve as the world evolves, and that's going to mean, frankly, we have big advantages. And I, I think countries that um, are ethnically homogeneous, they have some advantages, we've talked about those, but they have some disadvantages. And, and I uh, think that what the trick will be to learn what are the dimensions along which you have to be homogeneous, and what are the dimensions along which it's not quite so crucial that you be homogeneous. I think myself, and America fits this, that it is important that you be homogeneous with respect to commitment to certain values. Certain core Amer American values. Isn't Absolutely that, right. That the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, but it doesn't the matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what your religion is, actually, it turns out. The core American values, I think, are a certain tolerance, not perfect. I've already said it's not perfect, but a certain tolerance, a certain... We don't emphasize, my country doesn't emphasize equality of outcome as much as uh, Northern Europe does, and I wish we were a little more Scandinavian in that respect, but we do, as a value, care a lot about equal opportunity. That is, that everybody ought to have a chance. This is called the American dream. We're not doing well on that value right now, but it is a core value, and therefore it's possible to do, as I'm doing right now in America, to try to start a political movement to say, look, we're not doing as well on that value. And because it's a widely shared value, the idea of equality of opportunity, all men are created equal, and, and a certain, certain sense of, a set of values that we've inherited often from England, the sense of fair play, political fair play, and so on, you've got to be committed to those values. But I don't think you have to be ethnically. Okay. So I think we should end on that note, uh, uh, observing that as we had a discussion about Danish values, Americans always also have a sense of American values, core shared values. Thank you. Thank and you. And with this, we end the first part. Thank you very much. <laughs>